So welcome to this lecture in the course digital system design with PLDs and FPGAs. In the last lecture we have uh, completed um, the examples on VHDL then we started uh, with some issues in um, the finite state machine or the controller. Uh, we have looked at um, how to bring the state machine to a starting state using a reset very simple thing. But if you forget then um, it can be problematic okay. Uh, this is like you make a cable uh, and you want to crimp a connector and normally there is an outer uh, ring and if you have not put and you have gone ahead and crimped um, then you realize that you have not put the, the outer um, connector outer turn or something like that then it is uh, tough so something like that. So, you should not forget to to bring the state machine to a starting state by you know putting the reset. Second thing we have looked at is what is the uh, kind of um, uh, most appropriate clock frequency for a controller for a state machine. We have looked at the maximum frequency uh, but then um, that is not a good idea to run the um, uh, the state machine at the maximum frequency will dissipate lot of power. Suppose the data path is running at a much lower frequency. So what should be the criteria? How much you can bring down the clock frequency of the state machine and what are the issues associated with it and that is what we have seen. I mean we have not completed but then we kind of uh, set the case for minimum clock frequency and we have seen some effects. So, I uh, will just have a quick glance at um, this last lecture slide. I will not go back to VHDL because we, are, we have done a quite a few lectures on that. You must be thorough with it. So let us move to the slide. We will see the, the state machine part uh, as a revision then we will continue. So um, let us look at the slide. So this is the, the slide on power on reset. So this is the state machine. Uh, you know kind of structure you have the flip flops which gives the present state and that combined with the input will uh, you know um, give the next state uh, using next state logic. The present state is decoded to produce the output sometime some output may be just a function of present state and some output could be a function of the present state and input and um, as we continue this lecture we will have a look at what I mean what is the difference or what are the features of this Moore kind of output and Millet kind of output we will see that. So I said that suppose the flip flop uh, you are using in the technology suppose you are implementing the state machine in FPGA and the FPGA flip flop as an asynchronous reset or you are making it in VLSI chip and the technology uh, flip flop has asynchronous reset then it is easy to use that asynchronous reset. It is very quick as soon as you assert uh, the reset pulse uh, with a minimum delay uh, the present state become the 0. Uh, so naturally the, the starting state can be all zeros. you know that is the most uh, uh, easiest thing to do. Suppose you start with a state um, 0, 0, 001 then um, you may have to reset some flip flops, set some flip flops. So, uh, when it comes to the state assignment it is always easy if you can assign the starting state as all zeros okay uh, depending on the number of flip flops. So asynchronous reset uh, can be used and suppose uh, we do not have that asynchronous reset in the flip flop then we have to look for synchronous reset. The advantage is that uh, the synchronous reset can be an input um, to the next state logic and the game is that if it is asserted then we may we say that the next state is 0, 0 or the starting state okay. Uh, in this case you have an advantage that you need not reset to 0 uh, when you have a sync reset since it is part of the, uh, the next state logic you could make it easily uh, to any state okay. But if it is 0 it is all the more convenient and uh, we have also said in tune with the kind of synthesis we are doing at the RTL level 
it essentially means uh, like given to a synthesis tool and you know that the reset has priority over all other inputs then it, it means that ultimately the circuit is nothing but you have a 2 to 1 multiplexer at this stage with the reset as the select line when it is 1 the 0 goes when it is 0 the normal thing happens okay that is I mean we have seen that kind of synthesis I mean that is what even if you write equation an equivalent circuit is going to come at the output instead of a 2 to 1 mux maybe a, a simple AND gate comes and um, the sync reset can be if it is active high then it can be re inverted and can be given to the input of the AND gate. Suppose if the number of flip flops are 2 then there will be 2 AND gates and uh, the, the next state inputs are going to the D, D1 and D0 will go to um, one of the inputs of uh, each AND gate the other input goes to the inverted sync reset for active high and so on okay. I suppose that is simple enough uh, for you to work out. Uh, I just gave some detail about how it is going to be implemented um, when, when it is really um, you know worked out the equations are worked out. So that is about the power on reset and we have looked at the clock frequency and and the question was that what is the ideal clock frequency for the state machine okay. Now we know that what is the maximum okay this it depends on um, uh, this path and this path okay. So this path going all the way up to uh, some register or, or up to here you know since we do not know where it is going we will consider up to here okay. So it means that the clock period should be greater than. Uh, the TCQ because a clock comes it takes TCQ delay then the next state logic delay and that has to come here set up time before the next clock edge. So the T clock min should uh, be greater than TCQ plus T next state logic plus T setup or uh, it could be TCQ plus T output logic because even if it is it is something directly used here say. Uh, like it is it is crazy if this uh, path works properly but the output does not get a chance to to become you know active you know it, it before that it goes to the next state. I mean everything works internally fine but the output kind of does not have time to get decoded then it is a bad thing. So uh, that is the maximum frequency that is what is uh, we are putting it here. Uh, it, so we choose max of 2 paths you know TCQ plus TNSL plus TS everything max okay and um, this is uh, the TCQ plus T oil max and you should know that uh, like uh, even when we use the tool there are uh, the clock period we use the maximum time delay and for the whole time violation we use the minimum uh, uh, delays okay uh, because it is uh, the whole time violation happens with the, the same edge. So, uh, in the tool when you simulate uh, you have the opportunity to choose uh, the fastest delay or the slowest delay and all that corner cases can be uh, chosen when you do timing simulation. Maybe when we um, work with the tool I will show you how to do that. Um, so that is the maximum clock frequency but then we said uh, there is no kind of point in clocking at the maximum clock frequency because it dissipates a lot of power. Moreover we have some data path which is being controlled by this controller. All these inputs are coming from some somewhere in the data path and these outputs are going to the data path. So naturally and that data path is working at some frequency we optimize or we maximize uh, the clock frequency in the data path to get uh, maybe the highest throughput uh, in, in some application okay. So there is no point. Uh, to to kind of like uh, suppose that is working at 100 megahertz maybe it is uh, futile and um, uh, you know a lot of power wastage if you work uh, at 1 gigahertz uh, clock frequency okay. So the question is that what is the minimum we can do okay like given a known like if, if the data path is, is given then what is the minimum clock frequency we can choose and that was the question. And to illustrate uh, we have put I have put some kind of simple picture uh, uh, there assume the data path the in 
data path outputs uh, which is going to the um, input of the state machine that means again in this picture we have suppose 3 inputs in 1, in 2, in 3 coming from some part of the data path okay. Um, so I have put that okay so and uh, to understand the problem we have made it very uh, kind of simple. Uh, and very symmetric okay we have put square waves uh, like clock uh, which is not the real life at all that we, but we can as I said when you analyze always go for the simple case always go for the symmetric case regular case. So that um, once you grasp the underlying issue the basic how to solve it we can extend it uh, extrapolate it to the real life okay I, I have cited an example suppose you have working with the linear algebra with matrices and you are probably working with eigenvalues or linear transformation or rank of a matrix and if you work with a 5 by 5 matrix and try to get some uh, intuitive feeling about it, it it may not be possible but then if you say work with a 2 by 2 matrix or a 3 by 3 matrix it is possible that you can. Uh, come to a two dimensional or a three dimensional graph you can draw with the vectors and um, you can make out suppose you are applying some linear transformation what is happening to the vector can be easily understood then if you if you have grasped that basic then you go to 10 by 10 matrix that at least that clarity will come into the picture you cannot draw a kind of um, a graphical picture of the, the, the 10 dimension. But if the matter is clear uh, uh, in 3 dimension okay I am talking about uh, uh, the geometry, geometry to make the life easy but need not be okay. Um, not our subject directly not related but then uh, uh, you know some people are comfortable uh, to work with the algebra alone that uh, you do not uh, use such kind of isomorphism of going from algebra to geometry and back but anyway in geometry probably you are limited with the 3 dimension and so on. But anyway coming back to our problem um, we put very simple symmetric case let us assume yeah I have chosen very cleverly kind of manipulated case uh, in 1 is a some kind of uh, clock uh, kind of waveform in 2 is half of that in 3 is half of that uh, the, the clock period so the frequency is twice and this frequency is twice of that. So this is the scenario this is going to the state machine and we have put something like this okay. Let us assume the state machine clock is this and we have found absolutely no problem like uh, at this positive edge the state machine is in some state it detected that in 1 is 0 uh, then in 1 has changed in the next clock uh, edge uh, yes uh, it has transited maybe we are in a state looking for this input to go from low to high absolutely no problem because if we say uh, in a state in one bar you remain there in one you go to the next state and that will happen perfectly because at this stage it will be in that particular state but when the next clock edge comes uh, it finds that the in one is 1 and will transit to the next state maybe we will make some output to respond to this event and that, that is how we control. And here again it is 1 then it is 0 so it is it is able to track all the changes in in 1 and look at in 2 absolutely no issue uh, when this clock edge comes in 2 is 1 then this comes in 2 is 0 then in 2 is 1 no problem. But look at in 3 and what happens you know the clock edge comes to the state machine it detects a 1. Suppose there was a, a you know condition that as long as uh, in 3 is 1 remain in 1 this state and if in 3 is 0 go to the next state and you see that it has gone to 0 then it has gone to 1 but at the next edge it is still 1. In between it has gone to 0 it has come to 1 next clock edge our state machine still is detecting that in 3 is 1 and it will get stuck at that state it will not even proceed uh, to the next state and it is stuck there and waiting forever for this particular input to go low. 
So, you get the problem now. So, this clock is not able to detect the change in this particular input. So, for it to be detected we know that at least one active clock head should come in this period ok. Suppose an active clock head just come here we should have an active clock head somewhere here. So, like you should have an active clock head in this period and another in this period. So, naturally uh, one clock period suppose it is good if we can have one edge here and one edge here and so on. So, uh, you, we should have at least one edge in this period that can happen only if the clock period of the state machine is at least less than this particular uh, width. So, you see this is the maximum frequency input to the state machine. The clock period is from here to here ok. So, you take the half the clock period. So, the period of the real FSM clock should be uh, less than half the period. That means, the frequency of the state machine should be twice that of maximum frequency input ok. That is gain ok. So, uh, uh, so that is it ok. Now, maximum clock frequency should be greater than the twice the maximum input clock frequency ok. It sounds like you know in a kind of Nikus uh, criteria because in Nikus criteria you say uh, which definitely we are talking about the transform the frequency domain you have a signal and you want to sample it and you know the highest uh, the clock frequency highest frequency contained the sine wave then you should sample at twice that so that you can recover it. Something similar to that happens it should not be surprising because we are sampling uh, the input uh, though we are talking about uh, the digital uh, domain where we are talking about binary signals uh, not the analog signals and so on. Uh, yeah this happens because we are sampling uh, the inputs and first thing is that now let us relax. Uh, our criteria earlier we said ok we assume that yes it is fine um, it is a like a regular square wave but in real life nothing like that happens. So, uh, it is sampling the inputs input may not be very periodic uh, waveform, um, but you have a pulse width like you have a narrow pulse uh, that should not be the criteria for choosing the, the clock frequency because it can be stretched and the game is that you know I will show a picture. Suppose this is the input say the pulse width is 10 nanosecond ok assume that it is 10 nanosecond. Um, so, um, you will have uh, you know um, suppose this is uh, the next pulse come with after 1 microsecond ok. So, the clock frequency the frequency of this signal it may not be regular waveform, but assume uh, the minimum time period between them is uh, kind of 1 microsecond. Then uh, we can say the clock frequency the, the maximum clock frequency is kind of 1 megahertz, but this is 10 nanosecond ok. Now, if you choose a clock period to kind of detect the change in this input because we are this is coming to the state machine we should detect that. Uh, you know it has changed uh, the state ok. Now, to detect that we need a clock period which is only uh, less than 10 nanosecond that means, this clock frequency will be 100 megahertz, but the input frequency itself is only 1 megahertz ok. So, but the game is that uh, you know we can kind of stretch this pulse because the next pulse come only after 1 microsecond maybe it is even possible to stretch all the way to, to 500 kind of nanosecond or anywhere ok. And you can use a much lower clock frequency uh, to detect uh, this uh, change um, at the state machine. So, this is possible, but um, like it depends on the application suppose there is a requirement some event has happened and this pulse has come, but uh, say the controller should respond to that event within say 50 nanosecond then it is you cannot arbitrarily stretch it we have to use a clock frequency which is kind of the period should be less than 50 nanosecond because like after the input changes within 50 nanosecond 
the state machine should respond to it then uh, the clock frequency should be chosen um, according to that requirement. So that is what is written here the pulse width should not be the criteria it can be stretched how fast to respond to the event should be the criteria ok. So all these uh, the problem is that many a times you uh, read in the textbook you get a very uh, simplistic uh, kind of uh, solution uh, disregarding all these issues and even in real life when you interact when you, when you work with the specification many a times uh, these kind of requirements are not clearly spelled uh, even by your uh, the customer or the user uh, or it may not be clear you go ahead implement something uh, then you deploy it then you realize that. So uh, it is very important to ask uh, to be aware of these issues ask uh, the right question when you kind of um, form the specification and it is very important when you design some complex system uh, to write uh, these uh, specification the requirements in as much as details as possible and there are standard format uh, requirement specification there could be standard formats but I am not talking about the format you know these formats uh, the standards and all helps but even if it is not very organized very systematic writing it down writing the requirements clearly drawing some waveforms uh, writing some tables bring clarity to the scenario of course uh, you can use some kind of documentation standard because it helps you to use standard tools uh, to manipulate that it, like in a team uh, nowadays it is all connected environment so if you use a tool everybody can look at the tool multiple fellows can work on the same kind of um, file and so on so that is helpful. But uh, the primary uh, thing is to, to be aware of these issues and bring clarity to the scenario. So, so let us look at uh, this scenario uh, particular scenario where there is a pulse and I will show you a kind of um, uh, circuit how to do this stretching ok which is frankly not a very um, practical, practical in the sense there are better, uh, better ways to do it. So let us at the beginning. Uh, just for the argument sake uh, see a simpler uh, very simple uh, circuit uh, to stretch this uh, pulse uh, by whatever width you require as per your requirement. Uh, but uh, I mean practically we do not we do not use that I will show you a better circuit after that but this is to, to stress the point ok. So um, one other thing is that uh, here we talked about a pulse being detected ok. Maybe and there is no maybe there is no timing requirement great timing requirement it has to be detected before the next pulse then you can stretch it to any limit and you detect it whenever you want before the next pulse ok. But otherwise you say uh, the pulse width is 10 nanosecond but it has to be detected within 500 nanosecond no issue you stretch it halfway then you can detect it ok. But it may happen that. Uh, you may have to um, kind of you have a timing pulse ok and you have to detect it with certain accuracy. So if you remember in the case study we have um, you know discussed um, with respect to the ADC controller uh, we had uh, just before this lecture we had a case study where we wanted to have a controller which controls an ADC um, to give the start of conversion to ADC and store the sample in a memory ok. There uh, we said that the right to the FIFO should be of certain width and uh, we have decided to put a counter outside and uh, the counter will give a, a count from 0 to some particular count and we will decode that count and give back to the state machine ok. And state machine will detect that change when it reaches that count and stop that right pulse you know that was the idea. So we are in a similar situation I am showing in the picture uh, of course I am showing a kind of again an I little ideal case. So let us assume this is a timing pulse 
uh, we have started uh, this pulse at this point and the state machine is looking for the end of the pulse ok. But say this is some uh, few say, uh, say 500 nanosecond, but this being a timing pulse there has to be some accuracy on it. Suppose uh, we are giving a delay uh, like uh, around 500 nanosecond and suppose the state machine is sampling this pulse with a clock period because this pulse is going high here going low here. Suppose we use a clock like this it looks perfectly fine because uh, this clock earlier would have detected that it is uh, you know 0. Then this clock edge it is detecting that it is going to 1. Then uh, at the next clock edge it is detecting that it is gone to 0. But our aim was to somehow capture this delay with certain accuracy. But what happens now what we capture is that we will check at this active edge that it is 1 this active edge it is 0. So, what time we detect the state machine detect is this time period not this time period ok. So, that is the issue and suppose you use a higher clock frequency little more higher clock frequency there are positive edges here. So, we are sampling at all edges. So, here before it was detected it is 0 at this point it detects that it is going high and you see uh, here it is 1 here it is 0. So, uh, here if you see that real timing pulse was this and here the pulse width is this. So, we are much closer here suppose the requirement is that suppose this is um, uh, kind of uh, say assume that it is 100 nano and uh, this has to be detected with a kind of accuracy of say 90 percent ok. So, the error should be 10, 10 nanosecond ok. So, assume that means this uh, this should be detected within 10 nanoseconds. So, it tells that the, the clock period should be kind of in that order you know the clock period clock edges should come uh, in kind of within 10 nanoseconds. So, that is what is I have written to detect a pulse with certain accuracy minimum clock period should be less than the error requirement ok. This is quite intuitive, but uh, when you do many complex thing you forget you can tend to forget this it is very natural that if the counter is working with a 100 megahertz and uh, the state machine which is controlling that counter is working with a 1 megahertz you know that there is something wrong you know the counter is changing state at um, 10 nanosecond and um, uh, the, the state machine is looking change looking at sampling at 1 microsecond is, is something uh, uh, not acceptable. So, that is what is um, the game is. So, this should be uh, kept in mind as far as when you have a timing requirement, but in any case, but to make an assumption that everything should be greater than uh, any frequency used in the data path will be a over simplification. And nowadays, you have lot of constraints on power, uh, the timing, and all that. So, it is better to uh, choose the optimum clock frequency which uh, minimizes uh, uh, the power dissipation and many other things like that. So, uh, that is about um, the, the, the accuracy of a timing pulse. So, let us look at uh, this scenario we have a pulse and which is actually the frequency is low, but the pulse width is very narrow. And if you just consider the pulse width we will end up use choosing a clock frequency for the state machine which is very high, but if you stretch it because the frequency is very low then you are able to use a higher clock frequency sorry lower clock frequency for the state machine. So, to illustrate the principle I will show a pulse stretching circuit uh, then we will come to more practical uh, circuit ok. So, let us uh, keep uh, look at this pulse stretching. So, what we do is that this is a pulse catching flip flop uh, you see this flip flops and this is a pulse in this case a narrow pulse come this is a input and with a very low frequency the pulse come again ok. And if you kind of concentrate on this pulse width then you will choose a clock period which is less than this width and that could be very high ok. So, assume 
and that we want to stretch it stretch it to kind of somewhere here. So, what we do is that we have a clock and reset, but the clock goes to this flip flops, but this catching flip flop has the clock uh, as this you know it takes this this pulse as a clock and the D input is given to 1 ok. So, what happens is that when the pulse come this S detect. So, I am calling this DIT and this is synchronous detect. Synchronous detect you see that it goes high ok. So, the detect comes on the next clock edge um, yeah. So, here it goes high and the next clock edge that is shifted here and in the next clock edge it is shifted here that is what is shown here it goes output goes high in the first clock edge it comes here in the second clock edge it comes here. The moment it comes here it goes back and reset this game and this goes low ok. So, the this pulse is stretched by one clock period because it looks as if it is two clock period, but it cannot be two clock period because uh, we are not sure when the pulse pulse is asynchronous to this clock. So, it can come very close to uh, 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 this kind of uh, this clock can come very close to it. Uh, and uh, that is why I mentioned is not a very practical circuit. Uh, I will show a practical circuit soon, but this is to kind of understand the principle. So, uh, we give two flip flops to get a one clock period stretch. So, that is how it is stretched. So, at the beginning it is reset, everything is reset, and then uh, the pulse come, it is kind of stretched by at least by one clock period. You want to stretch it by two clock period, you put one more flip flop and so on, ok not a very practical circuit because there could be timing issues at this point uh, when the input comes here uh, with this flip flop. Uh, maybe if you put a chain of flip flops it gets resolved. We have not seen what is that timing issue, but so I am not able to kind of uh, uh, discuss that now and it is problematic it is not a very practical circuit. Suppose you want to stretch it to some kind of uh, 10 times a clock period then is not not a very uh, uh, kind of practical circuit. But then you might ask um, I mean why to stretch it and you know you reduce the clock clock frequency and so on. So, we will look at a more practical uh, circuit. Uh, so, um, that is using something called a pulse to level converter and a level to pulse converter. That means, the basic idea is that when we have a pulse instead of just stretching it when the first pulse come we will make an output of this some circuit to go high like that continuously high. The next pulse come that high is made low ok. So, uh, there will be between the pulses you will get a kind of square wave and what we do is that at the at the state machine when it goes high we will convert it into a pulse in terms of the clock frequency of the state machine ok, which could be decided by some other input ok. We are not sure this input is very low frequency maybe there are some other input which is higher frequency than this that will decide the clock frequency of the state machine and using that this the pulse going high that will be converted in the in the in the, in the, the FSM to another pulse which is wide enough to be detected by the state machine ok. Uh, that is a game. So, what we will see first how to convert a pulse to a level. So, that is what is very simple. So, assume that this is a pulse ok. I have not shown a lot of kind of uh, gap, but assume there is a gap then the next pulse come next pulse come and this is a D flip flop. You see the pulse is given as a clock ok and at the beginning it is reset. So, you have I am calling this I because it is going as input to the uh, to the state machine that conversion logic. Uh, so, the I is low, uh, but when uh, the, the, the pulse positive edge comes you see this, this is inverted and given. So, that uh, this was 0 at the beginning then uh, when this pulse come it becomes 1 and it remain there as long as the next pulse come. The next pulse come it was already output was 1. So, that is inverted and the 0 comes here and goes 0. So, uh, between the pulses either it is 1 or 0. Now, we take it to the state machine and state machine has some clock it is enough 
if you get a pulse uh, of that state machine clock frequency at this starting and this point or if it is a negative edge we can make it here it does not matter ok. So, I will show that uh, kind of uh, circuit and uh, so this is the input which is a, a, a level you know we have uh, converted the pulse to a level signal or a pulse to a toggle signal that is I and this is I that we are giving it here ok. Now this is a practical circuit uh, I am putting two synchronizing flip flops we have not studied why the synchronizing flip flop is required uh, that is to basically to meet the setup time here ok. Uh, at least otherwise uh, the this flip flop can get into something called metastability we have not studied maybe towards the end of the lecture uh, end of the course uh, I will touch upon it I hope I will have the time uh, to get into it. But this avoids that uh, probabilistically no it is not that this scenario is completely removed but um, with a high probability that is kind of uh, that scenario is averted uh, that is basic game. So, do not worry about this at all. So, assume that I comes here it goes through a single double stage synchronizer it does not matter as far as timing is concerned I 1 is a delayed version of I, I 2 is a, a, a delayed version of I uh, you know I 1. So, I 2 is kind of 2 clock period delayed version of the I ok that that is a game. So, we will uh, see so the pulse come you know like this a toggle come. So, assume at the at the starting point there was a pulse here and there was a pulse here we have converted to toggle. Now this is where the all transformation happens we have an input uh, a flip flop its input and output is combined through a logic and assume that logic is that I 2 and I 3 bar ok. So, you assume an AND gate here I 2 goes straight to the AND gate I 3 goes through a bubble or an inverter I 3 is inverted see what happens. So, assume that this is the clock to the to the state machine and we which we use in the same this transformation circuit and the see the I 2 goes like this ok here the for analysis that is enough we do not have to analyze I and the clock comes and when the I 2 I 2 comes you see uh, the the clock comes. So, the I 3 will go high ok uh, in the next next clock edge, but you see that I 3 we are looking for a scenario where I 3 is low and I 2 is high. So, uh, you see I 2 is high here, but the next clock edge only the I 3 will become high. So, uh, at this point with a 1 clock period there is a condition that I 2 is high and I 3 is low because this clock edge only the I 3 can go high because it is at the, uh, the output. So, uh, I 2 I 3 will give a edge a pulse which is of the duration of the clock, clock period with a, with a slight shift and that can go to the state machine and state machine is using this clock. So, naturally it will sample and detect this pulse correctly ok. So, it is a very clever circuit uh, I hope you got uh, the picture uh, this was I 2. So, I 2 was 0 before and in the next clock edge here only the I 3 will become 1. So, before that so during this period I 2 is 1 I 3 is 0. So, you get a pulse and that only happens for this 1 clock period it does not happen here it again happens here. Suppose you want to catch the if you want a pulse at the negative edge you do the opposite that this point is low and that point is high and that happens at the negative edge you can kind of analyze it. And uh, suppose you want uh, the pulse at both edges at here and here for some application then you know that it is nothing but I 2 I 3 bar or I 2 bar I 3 which is nothing but I 2 x or I 3. So, depending on what you put here may be an AND gate with a bubble here or an AND gate with a bubble here or an XOR gate you get uh, any of these pulses for our case we are going to use this ok. So, we uh, where we have a pulse using this particular circuit you convert it into a level signal ok and this input is 
goes uh, through a double state synchronizer to avoid some timing issue in this flip flop and then in this flip flop we combine the input and output through a kind of this logic very simple logic then you get uh, the, the correct pulse and very important the timing is correct because we are you know deriving with a delay with respect to this clock head that pulse will come with a delay and when this pulse ultimately goes to the state machine, state machine will correctly sample it as, as high you know that is very. So this generate the proper timing as far as the state machine is concerned because state machine is working with the, the same clock that is assumption. So I hope uh, you got this picture it is a very useful uh, kind of uh, structure which is very much used. Uh, in synchronizing clock domain crossing only difference is that I have little bit manipulated this and when uh, this pulse is coming from a domain with another clock then there could be a slight change in the circuit the pulse can go here uh, uh, in the in the data path uh, but the clock of the domain comes here you now it is a very slight change it is a very useful kind of principle and put together so I am putting this at the input and uh, side and this is the output side and I am combining it. So this is what uh, which does the trick or the magic uh, you convert a pulse to a level signal and you synchronize it and you convert level to pulse which is in this clock domain properly uh, then the timing is proper uh, with this clock domain. So that is uh, how the pulses are handled and so essentially we are saying that um, though we said uh, the, the FSM clock frequency should be twice that of the maximum input clock frequency. Uh, we should not be worried about the pulse width, uh, we should be worried about the frequencies and if the pulse width, uh, if there is a pulse it can be stretched. Uh, to be neatly detected by the state machine okay uh, and we do not uh, like uh, in, the, in the first circuit we have shown it is kind of stretching it integral number of the clock cycle but then this is a better scheme uh, we are not even stretching it we are toggling it okay. Um, it is a kind of uh, uh, extreme case of stretching it we are stretching all the way uh, to the next uh, pulse you know so it is like um, extremum that uh, we a pulse is stretched from uh, the, the first pulse to the second pulse then it is kind of made low it is made to toggle and then at the other end we convert back into a pulse which is of correct which has a correct timing that is the most important thing. Now let us look at uh, this uh, Moore and Millet output. So there is a confusion uh, where the Moore output should be used where the Millet output should be used. If you read a textbook many a times it, it appears as if um, you are um, making a big choice at the beginning of the design saying because many a times it is called Moore machine and Millet machine and that is very confusing you know it is as if uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the design process you are assuming the, okay, le, okay let us uh, go ahead uh, and design a Moore machine it is not so because there are in practical controllers there are a lot of inputs lot of outputs some outputs are a function of the present state some uh, are function of the present state and input. So uh, it is not a question of uh, kind of designers um, uh, preference to choose a Moore output and Millet output that is what I want to, uh, to bring forth. Uh, there are uh, places where the Millet output is kind of works properly and the best uh, option then is to choose Millet output okay. There are places where the Millet output cannot work okay there at such places you should use the, the Moore output and the discussion may not be complete uh, at this point there could be questions asked which um, with, the, with the present background I cannot answer you everything maybe as we go, go ahead uh, in, the, in, the, in the lectures maybe some issues are handled some issues are not handled but anyway we are improving our um, uh, the grasp of the situation as we go along. So let us look at our case study where uh, we have a, a controller for ADC I will take a kind of simple case from there. There 
uh, the, the, um, the state machine was generating a start of conversion pulse ok. So, that is a scenario. So, let us look at that state diagram. So, this was uh, uh, the state diagram. So, let us go to the slide. So, if you remember I hope it was simple enough. So, in the at the power on we come to a state ok and and we were waiting for the start signal from the host uh, CPU. As long as the start was low we remained in this state and the SOC was the start of conversion pulse was 0. When the start signal came uh, the state machine or the controller made a transition to the next state state 1 and this particular output I am only showing the, uh, the kind of um, the concerned output or the relevant output ok. So, SOC was made 1 and it is an unconditional transition in the next clock pass uh, we go to S2 and make SOC 0 and we were waiting for end of conversion here ok. So, that is a clear picture and since uh, this is an unconditional transition. So, upon the start like when the start is detected on the clock it comes to S1 in the next clock it goes to S2. So, you know that the pulse width of this SOC is 1 clock period because the minimum time a state machine can remain in a state is 1 clock period because everything happens uh, in terms of the clock period in terms of the clock edge ok. So, this is a Moore output. So, if you see that this SOC is a Moore output which is a, a present state is decoded that means that uh, like when you write the output logic we say S0 state 0 in our discussion we said it is two flip flops uh, the q1 is 0 q0 is 0. So, we say in the output uh, the present state is 0 0 output is 0 present state is S1 which is 0 1 the SOC is 1 present state is 1 uh, 1 0 SOC is 0. So, it is a Moore output during the uh, S1 the output is 1 ok. Now, I am trying to convert this particular SOC uh, into a Mille output ok. Uh, so, how we can do that? So, what we do is that say because we have only one input the start signal. What we will do is that you look at this scenario when the start is low it is machine is in this state SOC is 0. When the start is 1 transit to the next state and made make SOC 1 in this state and transit to S2. So, we will uh, do like this say we will say the machine is in S0 state as long as the start is low remain there. Now, we say instead of SOC 0 we say SOC is 1 if the start is 1 ok. So, SOC is written as a as a function of start SOC is 1 if the start is 1 then uh, then we say when the start is 1 we transit straight to the next uh, next state. So, that is that is what I am showing here the Millet output is upon the reset comes here as long as start is low remain there and SOC is equal to start that means in this particular state as long as start is low SOC is low when the start comes high the SOC is high. That means this SOC is a Millet output which is a function of the input start signal and the present state ok. So, we are decoding the present state. So, when you write the equation when you write the table we say S0 which is nothing but 0 0 and we have an input column where reach start start is 0 then SOC is 0 when in 0 0 start is 1 SOC is 1. So, in the equation of SOC you have Q1 bar and Q0 bar and start ok that is the equation of SOC. And now we do not need S1 as the start comes in the same state the, the SOC is goes high and it transit to the next state and SOC is made 0 ok. So, that is uh, the scenario that is how the Millet output is generated. Now, uh, we can see and already you get a picture what can happen and if you are 
clever a clever student can already make out uh, yes there is an advantage uh, saying that this particular state is kind of knocked off and you get one state less and you can imagine if there are uh, this is we are talking only about one particular output if there are 10 outputs which was all kind of more kind of output suppose we are able to translate you know convert all that into milli output maybe the 10 states are less and that is a great saving and uh, 10 states are less if it is a binary encoding log 10 to the base 2 it can be uh, you know 3 flip flops could be less you know in the game okay depending on the, the total state. So there is an advantage uh, we clearly see the number of states are less but this already should give you some hint. Uh, as to what can go wrong like we are waiting in this state and the start comes then the SOC is 1. So that should that description itself should give you some picture of what can go wrong. So we are coming to the end of the lecture. So we will see that timing in the next class a little more elaborately. So because as I said uh, the, the we are seeing uh, which is the optimal uh, scenario where we can without uh, you know kind of any timing issue we can use melee output and get some advantage and where we cannot use it we should be using the more output is what we are discussing. So we have seen how to convert a more output case to a melee output case we will look at the timing issue in the next lecture. So we have looked at basically the, the minimum clock frequency and the melee and more output in this lecture please revise uh, um, grasp the underlying issue. I wish you all the best and thank you.